I'd just like to say two quick things. First, to be a college president in the 21st century means, if you're going to do a good job or a great job, that you have to be practical, that you have to know how to read a spreadsheet, that you have to be able to develop relationships quickly, that you have to network in all sorts of interesting places. Secondly, I want to say one other thing about our moderator because she happens to have all of those skills. She's also somebody who, if you travel to conferences um, and you say, I'm from Rhodes College, even in only six and a half months, people will say, oh, I know your president. <laughs> and people will say, I knew your president because she was a professor where I taught, or I knew her as a scholar in the field of philosophy, or I knew her as a provost or a dean or a director of an interesting center, or I knew her for being an amazing president of Austin College for eight years. Um, whatever they knew her in her capacities over her career, um, I am so proud that we know her now as the 20th president of Rhodes College, President Marjorie Haas. Thank you so much. Thank you, Milton. Thank you. I'm so glad that you could be with us for this very special event. It's been a wonderful day. We have broken bread together. We have heard from our students and our faculty about the amazing work that they are doing inside our campus and inside the community. And this seems like a perfect cap off to this wonderful uh, day. I knew that I wanted to lead a conversation about uh, what it means to be a liberal arts college in a city. And I knew also that I wanted to invite some of my favorite and most admired college presidents to join me. And so this is uh, really uh, the fulfillment of a dream that I have had since we first started talking about the inauguration. You have uh, handouts of uh, programs that give you detailed information about our panelists. But I will say a few words about them each, both professionally and personally, uh, before we get started with some very hard-hitting, journalistic, gotcha-type um, <laughs> questions. Um, I will start at the end with uh, John Smorelli. John is not Joanne Berger Sweeney from <laughs> Trinity. Joanne was unable to be with us at the last minute. She sends her love to all of us. Um, and I'm very grateful that uh, John Smorelli, the president of Christian Brothers University here in Memphis, was able to join us. John has quickly become a good friend and a trusted colleague in just my short time here. He is uh, very wise in the ways of building a relationship between the college and the city, and I'm so pleased that you could be with us to join in the conversation. Uh, John is the 22nd president of Christian Brothers um, and its first permanent lay president. So you also have broken um, some uh, stained glass ceilings, as I have, in joining, joining roads. Um, he uh, has served in senior administration positions at Loyola University and Lemoyne College in Syracuse, New York. He's a biochemist by uh, training and has a PhD from uh, the SUNY College uh, um, of Environmental Science and Forestry and also did a postdoc in biology at the University of Virginia. Um, he has been in uh, Memphis and at CBU since 2009 where he's been very innovative and has really developed a reputation on your campus and in our city for um, being an innovative educator and um, passionate about Memphis. Elizabeth Keish is a, sort of a, a longtime hero of mine. Mm -hmm. We have known each other for many years. I think we were philosophy professors at the same time. We both ran centers for ethics around the same time. We became chief academic officers around the same time and presidents around the same time. So we have a, a long-standing relationship and she's somebody whose just judgment I have trusted and I have watched in awe at the way she has transformed Agnes Scott 
uh, college. She's been president there since 2006. And she, again, uh, really has been a transformational president, uh, growing the size of the student body, breaking records for enrollment and tension, lasting, la uh, launching innovative programs in public health and uh, human rights, uh, environmental sustainability studies, neuroscience. Um, uh, Agnes Scott was named a top Fulbright producer and produced 30 Fulbright students, which is amazing. Fantastic. She launched a comprehensive $116 million campaign um, and has really emerged as a leader nationally in campus sustainability. Um, as I said, I look to her because she is so well known in higher education circles and um, I think will just continue to shine in, in that role. She was a, an, a professor at Duke University where she ran uh, the Keenan Center for Ethics. I think we may have um, a certain Professor Charles mm. McKinney who knew you at Duke. Yes, so, yes we've um, connected. <laughs> exactly. He has, he has promised to tell nothing. Um, <laughs> you have been on the faculty of Princeton, Randolph-Macon College, and Deep Springs College. You graduated from Davidson College. I think some of us in the room perhaps have heard of Davidson. Um, and you also received a PhD or a DPhil, I guess, in philosophy from Oxford University, where you were also a Rhodes Scholar. Michael Sorrell is a, a very dear friend of mine. You were a welcoming face in Texas, where we were presidents together. You helped me navigate Dallas and Texas. You held my hand when I wept about some of the new things I was learning um, <laughs> as a new president. And a, Not um, always good thing. That's true. <laughs> I think you stole some of my senior administrators. There was, um, but um, but you re also have been really a wise guide. And um, Dr. Sorrell ha is a uh, just such an innovator in in his work. He has transformed Paul Quinn, which is a, a historically black college, from uh, really on the verge of financial collapse to a national model now for how to do urban education and urban higher education. He um, arrived at Paul Quinn 10 years ago, and that's amazing, a decade already. And one of the first things he did was transform the football field into the We Over Me farm in order to battle the food desert mm -hmm. conditions of the community that surrounded his campus. And I'm sure we'll hear some more about that. Um, he has become the first, uh, Paul Quinn has become the first federally recognized urban work college and he um, has done some, again, just some remarkable things. I believe you uh, implemented a business casual dress code on your campus. Let's pay close attention to that. Um, <laughs> Paul Quinn has won HBCU of the year and uh, I think it's just going to continue to soar. Uh, Dr. Sorrell received his JD and his MA in public policy from Duke University. I'm noticing a trend. Um, and uh, your EDD from the University of uh, Pennsylvania. So we have really some nationally known thought leaders here with us. And I've invited you really because I want to pick your brains and learn from you as I uh, assume the presidency of Rhodes College. So perhaps we can start just if each of you would tell us briefly a bit about your institution and the city that is its home. So Michael, please start for us. Uh, my mother may raise me to be a Southern gentleman, so I will defer to the lady from <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, then I will, I just wanna start by saying, before I talk about Agnes Scott, I just wanna say how incredibly lucky you all are to have Marjorie oh, Haas as your kind. president. I mean, I, you, she is just. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I have watched Marjorie's leadership at Austin College uh, over the, the past eight years with great admiration and just your, the incredible energy and spirit that you bring, you. not only to your campus work, but to your national networks. and. You're so supportive of your colleagues across the, the country. And so um, I'm, 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 I, I said to somebody earlier, I'm a lifetime paid up member of the Marjorie Haas family. <laughs> so 
Thank you. So I'm so glad I'm here. I mean, I saw the weather forecast. I thought there is no way I'm going to be able to fly from Atlanta to Memphis today, but I my flight was on time. Thank you. So I'm really happy to be here. So Agnes Scott College is a women's liberal arts college. It's in metropolitan Atlanta. So uh, we are 128 years old right now. Um, and uh, so a little bit about us, you know, a women's college. We are a very diverse uh, student body. Um, there's no racial or ethnic group in the majority on the Agnes Scott campus. That's one of the things that's very, very special about Agnes Scott. We're basically about a third white, a third African American, about 12% international students, about 9% Latina uh, right now. And uh, we draw about half of our students from Georgia, and but then also from 43 states and, and 37 countries. So just to kind of give you a little bit of a sense of that, we're in Decatur, which is a really cute little town that's inside the perimeter of Atlanta. So it's a, uh, mm. um, so one of the cool things for us is that we can connect students both to Decatur and to Atlanta. And, um, and I would say that one of the ways in which, uh, so I guess just one more thing about Agnes Scott is that um, uh, we have a signature program um, it's called Summit. It's a brand new core curriculum. It's in its third year. Um, it provides every student with a robust focus on global learning and leadership development. And they also, each of them builds a board of advisors and does a digital portfolio. So this is the kind of the, you know, what the, the core summit, four pillars of, of Summit. And I mention that because, you know, for many years, Agnes Scott has been related both to Decatur and to Atlanta. We've encouraged students to do internships. We've had, um, we've had some very uh, uh, faculty across the curriculum in religion, in economics, uh, who have uh, done very interesting service learning classes for, with, with students. But Summit has provided us with a framework or a scaffolding mm -hmm. that I think has made these relationships more meaningful and more deep. And so I just want to give a couple of examples. Um, just sure. to, you know. So one is that uh, as part of global learning, you know, when we said, OK, global learning is going to be central for every student's experience, we wanted to make sure that students understood that that was, that the global includes the local. Mm -hmm. And so global issues are present in Decatur, Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia. So um, uh, for instance, with the core curriculum, we have uh, for the past several years focused the global curriculum on in the fall of every student's first year on food. Food is an incredibly important mm -hmm. global issue. It's also a really important local issue. That's why I love the food desert, yes. the football right. field. Turn, you know, that. That's really cool. So their very first weekend, students are um, uh, doing volunteer work with Global Growers, which is a refugee agency that enables refugee families to grow their own food. Um, and then they're studying both local and global issues. And so then in the spring semester, they're actually traveling all over the world and they're seeing you know, the same issues, food issues in Cuba, food issues you know, around the world. So it's been a very interesting way to be able to connect the global and the local yes. and to integrate it into the core curriculum so that every student has that experience. And the one other thing I'll, I'll mention, and I think this is part of the magic of really thinking about how you can partner with the city, is that every city, every community has things that distinguish it. So for, for Atlanta and Decatur, we are a major refugee resettlement area, mm -hmm. and we're also kind of the home of public health. Mm -hmm. And so we've taken advantage of, uh, with the Centers for Disease Control and the Carter Center and things like that. So we've taken advantage of both of those things. We are partnered with a school for refugee girls that's housed in uh, Decatur Presbyterian Church, which happens to be the church that, that founded Agnes Scott. Uh -huh. And those girls uh, have lunch every day in our dining hall. We have uh, classes that, in, uh, that work with them. Um, and we have students who intern with that school. And I'm really proud to say that we now have our first um, Agnes Scott students who graduated from Global Village School. Mm. So that's a really, Very really cool. powerful connection. And then similarly with public health, we have students doing a lot of really interesting public health work at the CDC, but also in DeKalb County, really, again, looking at both the local and the global and how they, how they connect. That's wonderful. Terrific.
Michael, are you ready to go now? Yes. All right. <laughs> I, I have fulfilled my mother's requirements. Yeah, I, I will, we will write her a note. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so for, first, let me just say that, you know, to echo Elizabeth's sentiments, like, I'm so happy for you guys, um, but I, I just met Rhodes. I'm really happy for oh, you. Oh, thank you. Right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you want your friends to be in amazing places. You want your friends to be in environments where their genius and their abilities will shine. Um, and I think you've found that here. Great. So I, I, I am, think so. I'm thrilled. Um, so Paul Quinn College is 146 years old. We were founded to educate freed slaves and their progeny. Uh, what we were really founded to do was to educate those people who come from struggles and are looking for paths forward. Uh, we decided, when I became president, um, it'll be amazingly 11 years in March, um, we were a year away from going out of business. Everything was broken. Um, and in that situation, it, you can either look at it as if it is troublesome, or you can look at it as the most incredibly liberating thing you can find. We were unencumbered by a history of success. <laughs> right? So we just blew everything up. Okay? And we asked ourselves, if we were going to construct an institution for today, what would that institution look like? What is the responsibility of urban institutions of higher education to the communities they serve? And how do you define the communities that you serve? So we looked around and said, you know what? We're going to turn the entire institution outward and devote ourselves to addressing the needs of the day. Now, this has evolved over time. Um, we knew that health and wellness was a significant issue, um, but we didn't realize that food deserts would be a significant issue, right? Um, I, I didn't, you know, obviously I haven't missed any meals, right? I wasn't familiar with food deserts. My parents owned restaurants in Chicago. So food was something that I was intimately familiar with. Um, but the people in our community, the neighborhood was closer to the city garbage dump than it was a grocery store. Yeah. I mean, think about that for a moment. Think about the message that that sends. So we had a choice. We could continue to play horrific football, or we could address the food issue. I have to remind you, we're in Texas while he's closing the football. I mean, this, this was a big deal. This was a courageous move. It was. My, my football players hate me. Um, those alums will never forgive me. Every now and then they send me nasty messages on Facebook. We still hate you. Um, but we were a failing institution. So we decided that we were going to stop failing and that we were going to start from a position of asset-based instead of deficit-based. We were no longer talking about what we didn't have. We were only going to talk about what we did have. We had the ability to make a difference in the lives of others. We changed our institutional focus. Our institutional ethos is we over me. The needs of a community supersede the wants of an individual. It's that simple. You don't get to be selfish at Paul Quinn College. We detest selfish people, right? We think they destroy the fabrics of community. So our farm, um, has it's over two and a half acres. We have a 5,000 square foot greenhouse. We have aquaponic, I guess hydroponic tanks. Um, our, show you that we hold no grudges against football. Our largest customer are the Dallas Cowboys. Hmm. Um, we have enrollment got down to 150 students in 2010. Wow. In two years, we lost 400 students while we were right sizing and refocusing. Uh, enrollment now has gotten to the point where over 500 students. We are out of space. We have to build new buildings. We have a waiting list for students the last three years. We have to struggle to meet that demand. We're the first urban work college in the country because we realize 85 to 90 percent of our students are Pell Grant eligible. But just like everywhere else, our students were working. 80 percent of today's students are working more than 20 hours a week. So everyone's students are working. So why don't we help them instead of make life harder for them? So we created this work program. Our students work between 10 to 20 hours, 10 to 15 hours a week. Uh, with the twist we added as an urban work college, they can work off campus. So they're getting real world work experience in addition to everything else. What that also allowed us to do was to cut tuition and fees by $10,000. Mm. So the total cost of attendance at Paul Quinn is less than $14,500. You can graduate in four years owing less than $10,000. Um, and 
that's just the warm-up act, mm -hmm. right? What we intend to do, we're going to build a national network of urban work colleges. We're in negotiations right now for the next campus, which we'll be opening. And we are blowing up the entire academic side of the house. We're creating something called reality-based education, where every class is going to be devoted to teaching students in a project-based method how to solve the problems from their lives. So the professors are going to be challenged to incorporate student input in real time so that the students see themselves in their lesson plans. So we are excited about our future. It is a good time to be a Quinnite. Mm. Very exciting. John, tell us a little bit about CBU and some of the um, relationship or some of the things that, that right. make you so innovative. Love to talk about it, but again, I'm going to echo my two colleagues here and just welcome Marjorie, Thank welcome you. to Rhodes. We are just already excited about the opportunities to partner with Rhodes. You, you and I have already met, met on numerous substantive yes. opportunities and it's just great to have you in Memphis. So thank you so much for, for, for coming to Memphis, for, for joining the Rhodes community and we at CBU are ecstatic about that. Thank so thank you. Thank you much. So, um, CBU, we were founded in 1871 by the Brothers of the Christian Schools. Essentially, the Brothers of the Christian School, the mission is very, very simple. Take students where they are and bring them to leaders in their community. So really, in, in the emphasis on educating uh, uh, individuals who, who don't have a, a lot of financial resources. And so I've been president of Christian Brothers University for about nine years now, and the one thing that I felt we weren't doing enough of, in a very similar way to uh, my colleague with Paul Quinn, was that we weren't, we weren't doing enough with integrating with the city. What are we doing as a university? We, you know, we have strong programs in, the, in, in academics, but yet what are we doing with the, with the city itself? Our demographics are, are, are again, not the extent of, uh, of, of Paul Quinn, but our demographics are we're 40 plus percent Pell eligible recipients. Probably a third are first generation college students. A third are African American students. And we've now gone into the uh, DACA world in uh, full bore. So we've gone from about 1% uh, Hispanic students to now probably over uh, 12 to 15% Hispanic students. And we're very fortunate to have dollars from Dream US to be able to support this. But really our goal at CBU has been very, very simple. How do we partner with the city in ways that make us a, a catalyst for change, a catalyst for opportunity in the city of Memphis? And so we first tackled education because our founder, Jean Baptiste de La Salle, was the sort of the patron saint of teaching. So what do we do? We, we entered into the Shelby County school realm and, and we have been involved with uh, uh, the STEAM Academy, Middle College High School, providing dual enrollment opportunities for these students. They come on our campus. We demystify the college experience for, for these particular students. We take advantage of our engineering faculty and our uh, education faculty to go into these schools and infiltrate these schools to make them provide them and their students with sort of the vision that they can do more because clearly we have a, a failing uh, school system right now and how do we make it better? And in, even in terms of teacher training, another area where we've been focusing on is teacher training. How do we create urban teachers? Teachers who are going to stay in the profession for, for many years. So what we've been able to do is respond to the community. The other area we focused on is some graduate programs in, in health care because we, with St. Jude and, and Baptist and Methodist and, and St. Francis and all the other health care uh, providers, how do we contribute to that? So we began a, a physician assistant studies program, a master's level program, seven semesters, and it's been the first in this region. Uh, and, and so we're very, very excited about training, uh, uh, training sort of pre physicians in order for them to go out there and, and work in our community and make a difference to the health care of our community. We're really excited about what's going on. We really focus on Memphis as our laboratory for our students. So we have opportunities for them to serve, opportunities for them to learn. We offer our internships for each of our students. We really want Memphis to be our community. So all, although we're only 75 acres in sort of midtown Memphis, we want the city of Memphis and beyond to be our, our laboratory of learning. And so that's really been our focus. And it sort of has, has made a difference. And 85% of our graduates will stay in this region. I'm very, very proud of that. And in spite of sort of the demographics, 96% of our students either go on to jobs or, or go on to graduate professional studies. So we are sort of bucking the, the national trend of what the demographics, the opportunities for student, these mm -hmm. students, and they're really performing well yeah. uh, based on what we've been trying to do in terms of educating them.
These are tremendous and very inspiring stories. Our schools are really sort of bucking what has been a very traditional view of how liberal arts colleges operate. Mm -hmm. So the origin of our brand of education really had as kind of its center core idea that this kind of liberal education required isolation, that you needed almost to be cloistered or sequestered to have time for contemplation. And so most of our sister schools, liberal arts colleges throughout the country, uh, were intentionally built in places that were out of the way and on the edges and in the borders and away from the cities. And we are all leading institutions that are right in the heart of the city. It certainly provides us many opportunities. We've heard from you. We spent the afternoon hearing on our own campus about the ways we're partnering um, and engaging learning with our city. What are the challenges? Are there things that you find your urban lo location makes harder, that we have to work harder at um, in order to engage students, draw students, educate them, or is it just positive, nothing, no downside to, to this, or no, no difficulties to be overcome? Well, I guess I'll jump in. I, you know, I've, I've reflected on this that for much of Agnes Scott's history, even though you know you could say we are in an urban location because we're very, very close to the middle of Decatur, which is close to downtown Atlanta, um, the the orientation was very traditional. I mean, mm -hmm. it was that you know students stayed on campus. Yes, yeah, I think that and, was true at Rhodes for, for yeah. much of our Art. history. Yeah, well. so so I mean, it was you know, and I mean, even you had to get permission to leave campus, mm -hmm. but certainly not. There was no sense that it was part of your educational experience to engage with the wider world of, of Atlanta. So I, you know, I think about that, that as students arrive, one of the first things they get is their MARTA card so they can ride public transportation you know, into Atlanta. And, so, and then off they are, you know, off they're going on as part of that, that very first, uh, we, we took our entire first year class for leadership immersion to the Center for Civil and Human Rights mm -hmm. you know, as part we, of the- We do a similar the, thing with our first year Which is here with fantastic. The so, um, so as I think about are there challenges, I, I honestly think that at the moment, at least for us, um, there are no downsides mm -hmm. to being in an urban location. Um, I know that for some schools, including some schools in Atlanta, safety has been an mm -hmm. issue. Uh, I know that Georgia State and Spelman and, uh, and Morehouse were all schools that I have very close kind of connections with and mm -hmm. know their presidents yeah. very well, and that there have been some real concerns around safety. We're fortunate in you know, being enough out of downtown Atlanta that, that safety is not an issue. And that for at least the kinds of students that we're trying to attract, um, being in an urban location mm -hmm. is really a plus. Um, I, the, the, the head of enrollment when I first arrived at Agnes Scott um, said to me, you know, until a few years ago, our biggest problem was that young women thinking about a women's college wanted to live in a Clairol commercial. They wanted to run across a flowery field towards a white horse. You know, you know remember those old Clairol commercials? Uh, and, and, you know, that does not happen at Agnes Scott. You know, and so we were competing with places like Sweetbriar and, and Hollands, uh, you know, which were in these beautiful bucolic settings, right. and we were being outcompeted by them. So that was when I first, you know, when I arrived 12 years ago. And now I feel like, you know, being able to say, hey, you know, you can have an internship at the Carter Center, at CNN, at mm -hmm. the Centers for Disease Control is incredibly mm -hmm. attractive and, um, you know, really helps us attract students. Yeah. Michael, what about in your situation? Sure. Ours is a little more challenging. Um, mm -hmm. From a historical perspective, we, we are a historically black college, and they didn't put the historically black colleges in the affluent white neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Figure. Right. So we are, to give you a sense of the quadrant that we inhabit, we're at one part of the quadrant. The next part of the quadrant across the highway, because historically people put highways, right. and we'll come back to that. Um, <laughs> there's the garbage dump. Mm -hmm. The next quadrant from another highway is a penitentiary. And then the next quadrant is a neighborhood that is bracketed by truck stops, mm -hmm. okay? 
we are we have regional transportation that somehow doesn't quite work well for us okay we have no we're in a rail desert mm -hmm. yeah. okay when they did decide to put a rail on our side of town they built it with the aspirational new regional state university right now our neighborhood had been holding on we're right next to a train track mm. but instead of building the regional transportation down the highway they built it in the middle of a city where they had to lay new railway, right? So we're a work college that has to struggle to get their students to jobs, right? So we bought vans, we drive our students to work. The first year or two, we drove the students to work. Um, it was a unique experience in getting closer to your students. How are you today? Yeah. I'm doing well, <laughs> great. Can I, where would we like to get off today, right? Um, we, I mentioned, you know, we had, we were in a food desert. It took nine years of us constantly badgering people for us to get a grocery store. Mm -hmm. We were aiming for a central market and we wound up with a save a lot, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, progress. Um, we are in a high crime area, but part of being a good citizen, a good neighbor, we have some of the lowest crime rates of any of the schools in the area. Right, because we respect our community. So people respect our students. You know, the, the mistake people make is assuming that all crime is equal, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes, like, if you understand people's plight, if you try and help them, we have something called Weekend University, where we invite in people on the campus and say, what do you want to learn? What can we help you learn? We're not going to charge you anything. Well, we've got some food. We'll watch your kids, right? But one of the fascinating things is we expect people who live in under-resourced communities to trust the schools. The reason they live in under-resourced communities is because schools failed them. Mm -hmm. So their last relationship with the school was a negative one. Mm -hmm. So you cannot then expect them to trust their child when it failed their parent. So we're trying to disturb that relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so we have had a, a particularly difficult relationship, but we decided we'll change it. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm going to jump in just real quick. Sure, just please. Because I think the other the twist of that is the millennials. I mean, we've got the parents and safety and, and, and students who, you know, even though we've got a, a pretty diverse population, there's still that population of individuals who going into the city of Memphis is a, is a scary endeavor for them. So we've got to demystify that and find opportunities for them. So we have, in the month of September, we have called something called September of Service, where every day they, our students go out and, and, and visit a not-for-profit and, and get a sense of, of uh, how lucky they are as students and how they can make differences in, in yeah. the lives of individuals. And that's that's people, a little bit... People tend to fear the things they don't know. That's right, cool. exactly. By doing that, you're helping them get to know their community. And that, and. It goes both ways, yeah. right? You can't yeah. just say the city's there to be a laboratory yeah. and we'll use up its resources for our educational purposes. You have to be giving back constantly. Well, that's poverty yeah. tourism. Right, exactly. Right. Right. And it has, to be, it has to be reciprocal. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you something a little bit more um, personal. One of the things that I have certainly noticed coming to lead an institution in a city is that you're in a, a more significant media market than is true for many, again, of our sister schools. Mm -hmm. And that means there's more public scrutiny, not only of your institution, but of its leader. And I wondered, you know, how you've faced that. Has that been energizing, worrisome? Um, I just would be curious about your thoughts on that. I love it. Yeah. Well, right. <laughs> that's not a surprise yeah. to those of us who know you. I, I, I love it because, um, we live in an era now where you can tell your own story. Yeah. Right? I mean, when, when I came to Paul Quinn, we, uh, I inherited a fight with the accrediting body, right? Which people don't tell you all these things on interviews, <laughs> right? Um, but, and for the longest time, we just wanted to change the last paragraph, right? You know, in a news story where it's like, oh, you know, things, and by the way, everyone hates them, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so the goal was, what do we need to do to change the last paragraph? Well, you change the last paragraph by changing the things that people write about you, by doing things. And we just started doing things, right? Like, I mean, things that people didn't know about. So there was the farm, but we also, we had 15% of our student body didn't have glasses. Mm -hmm. So we used social media and raised 
$5,000 in 10 days and everyone got glasses, mm -hmm. right? Wow. We are 23% Hispanic. Um, so, you know, we got into yeah. the DACA issue. We got into DACA day one because the first two students that agreed to come to Paul Quinn when I was president were two undocumented yeah. Latinas. Mm -hmm. And they were really smart. They were number six and number seven in their classes. I don't think there's a liberal arts college in the country that does not have uh, do both DACA students and also yeah. undocumented students. So, oh, yeah. you know, this I is mean, an it's, issue it's not just reality. for urban schools. Yeah. This is an issue for every, every college in the country. But. So I, I think it's a blessing to be in a city where you have the ability to engage the media, mm -hmm. right? Invite them to the campus. Go visit the editorial boards. Tell your story. Um, it's so much easier to do that when you're right there right. Mm -hmm. than when you have to travel. I mean, you know, you used to have yeah, to travel. Yeah, I did. I traveled. I drove up that highway to Sherman to Dallas many yeah. times, uh -huh. many times, with Nan, I think, with me. <laughs> um, do you find, I mean, as a woman's college, are there certain expectations and certain uh, assumptions that the media some, in Atlanta sometimes makes about what to expect from Agnes Scott, or do they now know you? Well... It, it can be a challenge. I mean, Ag uh, Atlanta is a pretty saturated higher education mm -hmm. ecosystem. And so there's a way in which, you know, there's, I mean, first of all, UGA down the road, you might have noticed they played for a big, you know, championship mm -hmm. recently. <laughs> Um, and you know, that was one of the, when I first arrived, I was like, oh, okay, so football is the local religion. This is, you know, <laughs> this is gotcha. I, you know, I, I hadn't quite, you know, coming from Duke, we're basketball with the local <laughs> religion. You know, it was a bit of an adjustment. Um, but, you know, so UGA and Georgia Tech and then the HBCUs, the Atlanta University Center, also has this. Yeah, Spelman. Yeah. Spelman. Spelman, and, Spelman right? and Morehouse and Clark Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So um, Agnes Scott you know, part of the challenge has been kind of breaking through because, you know, it's, it's, I mean, sometimes I felt like I was literally on the rooftops going, mm -hmm. here we are, we're <laughs> doing amazing, innovative things, and the National Higher Ed Press is writing about us, Atlanta, <laughs> pay attention, you know. Um, but, you know, it's getting, it's getting there. I mean, yeah. it's, it's getting there, and certainly the, you know, the publisher of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution knows me well, um, and, um, and we, we have, we've been able to cultivate relationships with some of the, of course, media has been disrupted in all sorts of ways, too. Yes. And there's some online um, thought leaders in the Atlanta market um, who have gotten very interested in the work we're doing, very interested in, in the work we're doing in sustainability, for example. Mm -hmm. We've gotten great coverage. Um, from from that, so you have to sort of cultivate those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the other thing I would say in a city is, uh, and I suspect it's true in Memphis too, is that um, they are looking to the college and university presidents to to engage with the city, mm -hmm. to Absolutely. be. You know, whether it's, I mean, I've been on the board of the Woodruff Arts Center, for yeah. instance, and it was really interesting. Our biggest funder as a foundation is the um, the Woodruff, the Robert W. Woodruff Foundation, huge, they, you know, very, very important foundation in, in Atlanta. And I went to visit them, as I do periodically, and was just, you know, kind of, we were doing the opening chit-chat, uh, you know, before I got down to, here's really what we would need. <laughs> um, and, and their president looked at me and said, I'm really glad you're chairing the education board of the Woodruff Arts Center. Right. Mm. And it, it was such a, you know, it was like, thank you. Sure. And, you know, as I reflected on that, I thought, wow, that was a, a little signal to me mm -hmm. as well. You know, I mean, I loved it, but it was also the signal of, you know, I appreciate that you are investing in this community mm -hmm. and, and working with organizations that are not directly related to Agnes Scott, because yes. a lot of the work we were doing was K-12 sure. um, um, it's, it's, arts education. It's very significant. So. And, you know, John, I'm sure, like, Rhodes, CBU, under, sees that there are, many Memphians who care deeply about the city who will invest in our institutions because they see us as difference makers in the city. And not every institution has that benefit where um, you, know, you have your alumni body as mm -hmm. funders um, and supporting student scholarships. You sometimes have parents or um, close friends of the institution. But to have um, financial support for our students come from people who have nothing to do with roads, sure. but who believe that our students will make a difference 
in a city they care deeply about. Yeah, and most of the investment we've had are not yeah. people who originally were associated with CBU, but are just seeing some of the work. But I think what, in, in locally, from my, my point of view, maybe you've seen it a little differently because you're, you're relatively new. I was, I'm hoping for more news. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I know what, I've seen our st great stuff that you folks have been doing over the years that never was publicized, or great stuff that we've been doing that, that was never publicized. And then if there's an issue about, you know, a smaller issue, it became the, uh, the, big, the big issue. The uh, bad news. The bad news. The bad news. About and so I think we've got to find ways, particularly maybe you and I together, can, yeah. in Memphis particularly, yeah. to get, get the commercial PO Memphis business and some of the other Memphis Daily, to try to talk more about the kinds of things that, that yeah. happen. Because I'm feeling there's a lack of news, at least uh, from our point of view, yeah. because there's, there's just so much good going on at, at our institutions that we're, that's not getting out there enough. Well, and perhaps as Michael suggested, you know, we have to up our game in telling our right, stories, exactly. telling our own stories and not just waiting for that news to, to sort of um, uh, hit us. You mentioned uh, your students choosing to stay in Memphis. We see that at Rhodes. For approximately 40% of our graduates choose to stay here after graduation and work or continue their schooling, build a, build a life here. Um, I know that certainly the city of Memphis is keenly interested in retaining talented mm -hmm. graduates. Uh, do you find that in Dallas and Atlanta? Are your students staying? Are business leaders working with you to help retain your students? Yeah, I, th I think ideally we want our students to stay. I mean, it's becoming trickier because over 40% of our students come from outside the state right. of Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and that's true for, for Rhodes, certainly. Yeah. I think it's 75% it's of our students. But we, we, want, we recognize we will never become the institution we want to become. Uh, in a local context, unless our students stay, mm -hmm. invest, and transform. Mm. Sure. And when they do that, it transforms the impression of the institution and it transforms how the city feels about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and, and uh, we've certainly, uh, I, I, I don't actually have the exact percentage, but a significant percentage of our non Georgia students do end up staying in Atlanta. And Atlanta has been, for instance, one of the, the country's number one magnet for African American PhDs. You know, that's mm -hmm. it's been a, uh, you know, so so uh, um, so in in talking, for example, to the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce, you know, we we talk about that. What an uh, an advantage it is um, to have this ecosystem of higher education institutions, and especially since we draw a lot of students from internationally as well, mm -hmm. that a lot of them end up, you know, staying. Um, in Atlanta. I think one of the challenges for us, and I don't know whether this translates at all for, for Rhodes, um, is that, for instance, um, Atlanta has become a, a kind of fintech, you know, financial tech center. Mm. Um, and so we are working on connecting Agnes Scott to those opportunities in the tech sector. And sometimes that's a little challenging because we've got this little institution called Georgia Tech down the road, <laughs> yeah. you know, and people have this sense of, oh, well, so it's Georgia Tech that is the pipeline. To, mm -hmm. you know, and so we have to work a little harder to say, hey, you know, we've got incredible physics and mathematics students. Yes. We've got incredible econ students. Um, you know, liberal arts majors have the kind of flexible disciplined minds that they can, you know, they really can do amazing work. And we're actually going to be launching some graduate programs at Agnes Scott over the next few years. And we intentionally, I mean, this was very much driven by the faculty and by a market study, but we're doing things like data visualization yes. and applied technology. And part of it is, you know, these are ways in which liberal arts majors can build a bridge yes. to mm -hmm. tech careers, mm -hmm. um, where they're really drawing on their own Yes. Um, skills and experiences. And frankly, from my perspective, part of the reason I'm excited is we are sort of putting a flag up that says it is not your grandmother's Agnes Scott. Right. You know, um, there are and things for, going on here. For a woman's college as well, to be college. leading in those Exactly. Areas. And those are very much in the air here at Rhodes College as we begin our strategic planning process to think about those kinds of programs where liberal arts students will have an advantage. They need some additional sure. technical training and skills, yes. but once you give that to them, the, the advantage is ours, right? That's great, yeah. I think, I think the other piece is the internship piece. I mean, if you can yeah, get, them, get them connected Huge. with companies, so it's up to us to sort of make the connections with the CEOs and the, and the hiring folks at, the, at, our, at, our, at our corporations, and then getting our students there is, 
that's the, I think right. that's a, that's the seed to success from Ireland. Yes. I, I'd like to um, see if there are questions from uh, those of you who have come to join us today. I don't think we have microphones, so you may have to ask loudly, and then I'll try to repeat it so that because I think we're we're filming this. Um, so questions for our panelists or general questions about liberal arts in the city. Yes, Ira, please. Um, what do you all see as the strength and power of liberal arts in the for debate in the in the question of liberal arts in Ireland? Great. Ira, Ira asked about what do we see as the greatest challenge uh, for liberal arts colleges given that um, the impression that uh, liberal arts sometimes has more broadly or publicly. I'd love to, yes. to tackle that yes. um, because I've been thinking about this a lot. It's a yeah. great, great question. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, and Marjorie was there when some very interesting research was presented yes. uh, back in June. Uh, yes. And I've, I've uh, uh, we have, there's a research firm out of Baltimore that has done some research with Particularly, this this happened to be with um, prospective college students in the Midwest. So they, you know, that this, that's where they focused. What they found was that the term liberal arts was a little bit like um, chopped liver or spinach. Mm -hmm. You know, like um, you, you could have a description <laughs> of a school or a program, and the only change was you added liberal arts. You know, at this liberal arts college, you do this, or at this college, you do this, and there their attitude was less positive, like it was statistically significant less positive if you had the term liberal arts. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, their attitude to the components of a liberal arts right. education, mm -hmm. so, you know, critical thinking, right. writing, speaking, uh, learning history, learn all Probably of that something. was actually quite positive. So it's a quandary, I think. I mean, there's a long history of people dissing the liberal arts. So this just happens to be, we, we just happen to be living in an era where that's <laughs> happening a lot. And so, you know, I guess my sense is the biggest challenge is we need to sustain the, the heart of our mission, but also to be willing to um, be adaptive in both how we educate students and how we talk about how we educate students mm -hmm. in a way that will connect to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we talk about global learning and leadership development, both of which are really grounded in the liberal arts. Uh, but we, we're foregrounding that because we're realizing that's what, at least for us, that's what students are, are looking for. So, you know, sometimes I feel like some of our colleagues are, they feel like what we need to do most is to yell even more loudly right. about how wonderful right. the liberal arts are. And I guess my feeling is we have to be savvy about how we sustain our mission and communicate that mission to students, not hide the, the term liberal, liberal arts, but you know, it's not, if we keep yelling it, it's just gonna be more chopped liver. <laughs> you know, it's figuring out how do we communicate the value proposition of a liberal arts education in a way that prospective students and their families can hear. Uh, can I? Yeah, please. Yeah, the, um, so I'm going to take that and build on it and add a spin to it, right? And um, I think the liberal arts colleges have done an epically bad job with mm -hmm. their narrative, mm -hmm. right? I, th I think they brought knives to gunfights, mm -hmm. right? Um, everything that this country stands yes. for is what the liberal arts colleges do. It's the foundation okay, of Okay, it's the foundation, mm -hmm. right? But our messaging has been so bad, mm -hmm. right, that we missed it. So we're talking about all of this in flowery language, not realizing that people want a gritty language. Okay, don't talk to me about the pursuits of the mind when I can't pay my bills, mm -hmm. right? Don't tell me that it's insulting to, to talk about a career because that's not a purist pursuit, right? Tell me how I'm going to, how, tell me why if I pay you $65,000 a year that my child's going to have a job that makes our lives better. Tell me why these sacrifices matter. We didn't do that. And by the time we got around to doing it, we lost control of the narrative. Yeah. And so now we're backpedaling. Right? But the problem is, once you're fighting a fight using someone else's weapons, you can't win. Mm. 
Yeah. Do, do you so you've got to. Yeah. I mean, that's that's exactly. I mean, your point is a good one because I think we've lost control of the narrative in many regards. Because how many times we see on the news or somewhere the a politician going to a technical school and and you know giving a two year degree and this person's now got a job for seventy or eighty thousand dollars a year and and so so why do we need a, a four year degree when in fact look at and so that's been the narrative going all around instead of going back, as you say, to the, to the, gritty, to the gritty piece. Not that both are important. Both are crucial. I'm not yeah, saying that. But, but it seems like the, the narrative has gone the other way, saying, oh, you know, just get, get your two degree. Don't worry about you know, getting in debt and, right. and, get, and start a job. And, and what happens in five or ten years to that individual who, who is, who's now into a technology that doesn't right. exist anymore? Doesn't exist doesn't anymore. Right. That's right. exactly right. Do we have another question? Yes. He asked about what is the role of the liberal arts um, as new as technology grows and there's new opportunities for, for growing technology. And I'm going to take the chair's privilege and say a few words about that before I <laughs> turn it over to you. Um, I, I know you are, are all going to be waiting on bated breath to hear my um, address tomorrow. Um, and, and I actually talk a little bit about that. I um, uh, would argue that a liberal arts education, again, I'm not necessarily wedded to that call, but an education that really... Um, frees your mind to think um, is an education that is actually the most resilient uh, to new technologies because many of our students will, the jobs you will have are jobs that did not exist, um, mm -hmm. you know, the day you were born. They're going to be using new technologies, they're going to be demanding new things of you. A, a narrowly focused education is going to be very difficult to overcome when your job becomes obsolete or when it changes. I, I do think the um, best liberal arts colleges, and I would count Rhodes among them, and I would count the institutions represented here among them, have recognized that you have to blend a liberal arts focus and a liberating focus with an attention to career path, with an mm -hmm. attention to transferable skills, mm -hmm. uh, but to do so in ways that encourage flexibility rather than narrow specialization. We don't have to be afraid of adding technological skills, mm -hmm. but we also don't have to be afraid of recognizing that the ability to communicate, to solve problems, to think deeply, is going to be at the essence of the future world of work, no matter w what those technologies become and do. Yeah. I don't know if anybody wants to. Oh, I, I'm so excited about the future yeah. of the liberal arts. Um, in part because I think we get to make it up, yeah. right? Like I think that's right. It's up to us. Like we no longer have to be bound by what people define the liberal arts as, right? We are a liberal arts inspired college. Okay, we are a work college. We're drawing a direct connection, and then we went back and analyzed what is the essence of liberal arts, right? What are the skills that people are supposed to take away, and how do those connect directly to the marketplace? Well, number one. No matter what you do, you're going to need to be able to speak well. Number two, you're going to need to be able to write well. And then thirdly, you're going to need to be able to, be, to engage in critical analysis and reasoning. So how about we add all of those into all of the classes, right, across the curriculum? But that's reimagining the liberal arts. Like, we don't have to dance to that tune anymore. Like, we can make up our own version of it. I'm thrilled about it. I love that. And it, it's so fascinating to me that, you know, when the Agnes Scott faculty sat down and thought about what are the foundational leadership skills that every graduate of our college needs to have, it, it was exactly those. It was critical thinking, writing, public speaking, teamwork, because yeah, you have yeah, to be able yeah. to work with others. And then they added digital literacy. So yeah. to your point about technology that, you know, we now have to curate information that comes yes. to us through digital media and, and uh, education has to adapt to include that. So I am also very excited about the liberal arts and about the future of the liberal arts. Um, but it's also, it's a space for innovation and creativity. And the only, th the only thing I wanted to kind of add to what my fabulous colleagues here have said is that, you know, in a world where technology is disrupting a lot of ways of life and globalization is making the world both smaller and bigger in all kinds of ways, both good and bad, 
we need even more the sort of the humanistic inquiry of understanding what human beings need, how we create just communities mm -hmm. and societies. We need more philosophers. We do. We, of course, we need welders, <laughs> we but we really need philosophers. Philosopher yeah. welders. Philosopher okay. welders, <laughs> you know, and, or philosopher technologists yes. or something. And but ethicists. you know, and those ethicists. and ethicists, yes. well, those questions are so itself. important. So. Is there another question? Yes. That was Rhodes College's former name. It's it's an interesting point, and I'm glad you you used the word um, elite because I think a lot of what you have we have talked about up here has been a shift um, in the ways liberal arts colleges constitute themselves yeah. from serving um, largely an elite population, a population. Um, that uh, where students paid full tuition and their families, um, you know, and maybe there were a few scholarship students to the world of today where um, liberal arts colleges are giving back at least 50% at, at Rhodes and at other places sure. even more uh, to need-based financial aid and to financial aid to make it possible for a wider range of students to engage this. Mm -hmm. The liberal that we talk about in liberal arts is, of course comes um, not from a political word but from liberation. It's a, it's a f education that is intended to free you, to liberate you. Um, but yes, there is a, a sense, right, that um, this is an education for elites and that it produces elites. I, I would love to hear your thoughts um, on some of those issues uh, briefly because we don't have a, a lot of remaining time, but please share them with us. Yeah, I mean, I, I do, you know, what, what gives me the greatest pleasure on commencement is when uh, f our first generation students graduate, you know, and, and that, sen you know, that sense of this student's getting this degree is changing the trajectory for the, the whole family. So I completely agree with Marjorie, you know, liberal, I mean, we're 45% Pell. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot, you know, liberal arts colleges generally have become much more diverse across many dimensions, yes, economic, including so. socioeconomic. I think you do raise a really interesting point about rural students. Yes. Yeah. And um, I currently have an Agnes Scott alum who's really mad at me uh, because she feels like we're not recruiting enough rural students. Mm -hmm. And it's a real challenge because with limited resources sure. in enrollment, you know, how do you get, how do you raise the pro, uh, you know, with, in a small college? Right. I mean, how, you know, where do we go <laughs> to recruit students rurally? So I do, I think that the urban rural divide is a real challenge. Um, now, of course, there are a lot of liberal arts colleges that are rural. That's, most, of most of them are. Most of them are. So maybe I can just say, okay, they can take, <laughs> right. you know, I don't know. But, um, but I, I, I do think that there is that, there is that divide in this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Agnes Scott is doing anything to bridge it. Yeah. I'll be and, and I think we can yeah. be confident that students, even if they come from rural environments, students who receive an education, mm -hmm whether it's at a city college or want to be in cities. Young people, millennials, want to be in cities. Right. That's why cities are growing and why rural areas are shrinking. And one of the challenges is we haven't found in our country an economic lever that will help rural areas survive with the demise of manufacturing, the demise of um, small family farming. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to earn a living in a, in a, a rural area. and so. Millennials swamp to cities, and yeah, Can, yeah please. I just want I want to touch very quickly on something you said that I that I heard. You talked about the political divide, mm -hmm. right? And the onus being that the liberal arts colleges have somehow contributed to that. 
And, and I just want to push back on that yeah. in a little bit because I think there's something else going on in this country that we have to call out at every chance we get. There can be no place where decency, respect, non-sexist behavior, non-racist behavior is given quarter. Mm -hmm. Okay? If, mm -hmm. <clears throat> if by what people mean is that they need to be free to be bigoted, that they need to be free to be, be mm -hmm. horrible, reprehensible human beings, and that that is what we are supposed to welcome and, and give opportunities to on our campuses, I will fight that all day long, every day, and twice on Sunday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right? Like, Amen. So, so we shouldn't take that on and apologize for that. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, we can be more inclusive, absolutely. We can make sure people understand that their viewpoints are welcome. But there are rules yeah. to the society that we have signed up for. And I think we have to double down on reminding people of that. We are in an age of something very different going on, and I just don't think that that should make us change the way we do business because we are facing evil and we have to face evil on head on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. I want to just be no, quick here. Yeah. How do you follow that except except to say, uh, I mean, from a socioeconomic status, you look at what happens when when these individuals from family income enter our, our institutions, and after they leave our institutions, the number of steps they move up in the socioeconomic status right. is incredible. So that story is a very, very good one. I think going back to the rural, I've got a, one of my trustees there who, who may be real happy with me by, by saying this, but I think how do we use technology in order to reach the rural populations of right. individuals? Or can we produce a hybrid kind of, kind of liberal arts education using technology at times and, and, and bringing them onto our campus for maybe a shorter time? Somehow, some way to combine those. So I haven't figured it out yet. If I, if I could, I, I, I'll, I'll go back to my campus and do it right now, but I haven't figured it out yet. But what I'm saying is there may be an opportunity to, to reach that rural population by using technology technology. Uh, as Marjorie Paulson points out, a lot of the colleges are in, in rural segments, but, we, but the city colleges could, could potentially reach out to rural using some of the modern technology that, that's available these days. This has been very stimulating, and obviously um, we just scratched the surface. There are many, many good questions. I encourage you not just to think about asking us them, but to ask each other them uh, about these things. The questions and issues that were raised here um, really will should help us think hard as we think uh, about the future of Rhodes College. What is it that we want our institution to be? What does it mean to us that we are in, in Memphis? How do we understand the kinds of students that we want to serve and the kinds of students uh, that we want to produce, the gra kinds of graduates that we want to produce? So this has been incredibly stimulating. I'm so Thank grateful. You. Um, to have my friends here and then to have, uh, I have very smart friends, you might have noticed, <laughs> um, to have these smart friends here uh, share their vision and their wisdom with us. I am uh, really have begun already to talk to some uh, other presidents who lead liberal arts colleges in cities to see if we could begin to form some kind of national conversation as well to share these ideas, mm -hmm. to think hard about what we're doing here that's working well, because we are few in number. We really are the um, exception. Uh, rather than the rule, we think we're the best exceptions. Mm -hmm. But um, but I think there's a lot more to be done to think about um, how we can maximize this work for our students and for our cities. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for being with us. I have a gift for you somewhere. I do. I have you gifts for you. I don't know yeah, what they gifts. are. No, I do. <laughs> gifts. Um, oh, these are um, uh -huh. uh, medals. They're little pa uh, pendants that commemorate... Um, the uh, graduation or the, the uh, inauguration. So one for each of you. Very nice. And you, can, Thank you. Thank you. you may wear them around your neck as some of our community partners will when wow. they arrive at the inauguration <laughs> the tomorrow. Of Rhodes they, you can keep them uh, there. You can use them as a lucky coin to flip when you have to make hard presidential decisions. Uh, <laughs> and you do that by flipping a coin. So I hope that's just a small token of our affection. That's Thank you that's for being around. Please give that our guests a very warm Thank you.